Hello and welcome to this Without Walls message. It's so great to have you join us. Each week we upload a new message that is at the heart of what God is saying. We pray that you are enriched and moved by God's Word today. This is a wonderful day because God made it. That's enough, right? Is that enough to call today wonderful? This is the day the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad. And uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of reasons why you might not want to rejoice today. It doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm just being a bit silly. Is that right? Good. All right. All right. What do we got? 35 minutes to blow your minds. It's always Jesus. All right. Thank you, Father. We just thank you for this morning. You're so good. Thank you for your presence, Lord. Again, Lord, let it, let us just go up higher, Father, as we consider your word, Lord. Let us let the spirit of wisdom and revelation just breathe upon the word this morning. Let it come to life, Lord. Who wants to be separated by the sword of the word this morning? Put your hand up. Separate me, Lord. <laughs> uh. Uh, see, we're crazy, right? There's a craziness about following Jesus. And that's, you know what? People say Christians are crazy because they are. You've lost your mind. Crazy in love, yeah. In love people do crazy things. But Christians are crazy, absolutely. Yeah, the, in, in fact, Paul talks about being strangers in a foreign land, being like aliens, little green aliens walking around everywhere with metal hats on. That's what a Christian is to a lot of people. And that's okay. It's supposed to look different. Following Jesus is supposed to be the most natural thing and the most confronting thing in the whole world. (laughs) All right, that's nothing what I'm going to talk about this morning. <laughs> Maybe I wish it, I wish it was, but it's not. No, I've got. A, I feel like I've got a word for you this morning. All right, so can you turn with me to Revelations chapter four? <sighs> the last book in the Bible, Revelations chapter four. After this, and now we're in verse 1, yeah? After this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven, and the voice I had heard at first speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you things. I will show you what must take place after this. Come up here, and I will show you things. I like to think about this verse And in fact, this whole uh, two chapters of Scripture, Revelations 4, Revelations 5, as a welcome to the real world. Welcome to the real world. Do you know that there's a reality that uh, is, uh, is greater than the one we're in now? I mean, we are currently, this is reality. This is real. This is as real as it gets. But there's a superior reality. And in Revelations chapter 4, we have an invitation to come up higher and to see a much bigger picture, a greater reality, a reality that has been going forever and will continue to go for forever. Here on earth, our, our moment right now, it's very real. I'm not saying it's not real. It has consequences and it's very real. But there is a reality that goes on, a superior reality, so to speak, that runs in parallel with what we are experiencing here on earth. And it has been going on forever. And in Revelations, you get a a look inside what is that superior reality. So we begin to read about it and we get an invitation where Jesus says, 
come up here. I want to show you things. In other words, I want you to become aware of the superior reality that you live in. I want you to become aware of it. There is a need that we have as believers to see beyond what we currently see. And you know what? The devil works extremely hard at making us blind. If he can't kill us, he's going to dumb us down. If he can't just take you out, he's going to make you lukewarm. If he can't kill you, steal from you or destroy you, he will at least make you distracted, super busy, addicted to gaming, addicted to something, anything that dumbs you down and makes you aware of you being planted right here on the earth. Jesus says this morning, come up higher. I want to show you things. I want to show you things. And I want to see things. I want to see some things. Well, isn't the word of God wonderful for showing us things? We're going to have a look in at this superior reality. Can we do that? Okay. Let's have a read. We're just going to read. Let's read from from verse 2. Come up here. I will show you what might, might take place after this. And at once I was in the spirit and there before me was a throne set in heaven with somebody sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian and a rainbow resembling resembling an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumbles and peals of thunder. Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. And in the center around the throne, there were four living creatures and they were covered with eyes in the front and back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third was like the face of a man. The fourth was like an eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and covered its, covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. Day and night, they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honour and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and they worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. For you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. It's going on right now. Right now. And it was going on a million years ago. And then we have a look over in chapter 5 and it just gets richer and richer and richer. The appearance of a lamb that was slain, the partnership of heaven and earth, deciding the destiny and the purposes and plans of God for the earth, the saints and the angels and the elders and and, and God himself all working together in partnership, co-laboring to see... To, to, to open the scroll. Incredible, right? Incredible. And so often, you know, we read like something like this and we think, oh, you know, it's kind of, that's a crazy, that's crazy. It's crazy. That, that imagery is crazy. You know what? It's normal. It's normal. It's real. It's happening. And uh, really, like, if, you, if, you, if we want to, if we want to discover who Jesus is, The book of Revelations is probably the greatest picture of the ascended Christ that we have. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the revelation of him slain, 
resurrected, ascended and glorified. It's the full picture. You get it all. And it's, ab- it's an absolute feeding ground for growing in the knowledge of God. Knowing what our reality is. Amen. In heaven, there is a throne and it says in verse 2 that it is set. What does that mean? It's never going to be shaken. Ever. Doesn't the devil try to get you to think something opposite when you're, when you're earthly minded? But Jesus says, come up here. There's a throne that's never going to be moved. It's set. I want to show you it. There are four living creatures and they're covered with eyes. And uh, isn't it interesting that these living creatures have been there forever? It's, it's like an internal thing. They're like living creatures. Isn't it? I think it's, I think it's fascinating that those creatures, they've been there forever, but our earth hasn't been here forever. Earth is a reflection of heaven. It's a mirror of heaven. So there's, there's creatures in heaven. There's all this kind of stuff. And as a, like a, as a, as a blueprint, God uses heaven and he creates earth. And it's got living creatures. It's our reality, right? Heaven is reality. Jesus is saying, come up here. I want to show you what's real, what will last forever in this place. And it's like earth is a mirror of everything that goes on in heaven. And there's a stunning interplay of worship led by creatures and participated in by all. There's millions of angels. And you know what else? There's people. People. Right there in the throne room of God. There's people. 24 elders, in fact. And I just draw your attention to uh, what Pastor Jeanette was preaching on uh, a couple of weeks ago. Where... Um, preaching on Ephesians 2, but God made us alive in Christ and raised us up together to sit in heavenly places with Jesus Christ. (laughs) So now we see Revelations chapter 4 and 5 and we see this throne room reality and not only is it a place where all this kind of supernatural, extraordinary stuff is going on, but there you and I are seated right now. Right now. Made alive together, raised up, seated together. Together with Christ. Right there in that reality. There is a higher plane of being for the believer to sit in. A higher plane. And that's why he calls us higher. We see that we, in in Revelations 4, we see with Jesus' invitation to come up higher that we are set apart from the world and we are together with God, partnering with him and the angels for his purposes for creation. And and you know what? When we're like, when we are heavenly minded, heavenly minded, we pray differently. We actually begin to pray differently. What begins to happen is we begin to pray from that place down to uh, the earth, so to speak. And it's like, you know how there is, a, there is a battle that's raging right now, angels and devils and all of that kind of stuff? That operates in, a, in what we call the second heaven. But where we're seated as believers is higher than all that. Paul talks about the third heaven. The throne room, the glory. Revelations chapter 4, the throne. That's where we're seated. So when we pray, we're praying right the way from, from the highest place right the way down to the lowest place. When the disciples ask Jesus, teach us how to pray, what does Jesus say? Our Father who? Where is he? In heaven. Where does prayer start? Prayer starts from the throne room. When you pray, pray like this. Our Father who is in heaven. 
hallowed be your name. And then what happens? When you pray from the place of heaven, the heavenly reality, you begin to release the kingdom and the dominion of that realm. And you say, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So Jesus is saying to his church, come up higher. I need to show you some stuff. I need to show you the place where you sit. The devil works hard at robbing that from us day to day. Every morning we have to realign ourselves with who Jesus says that we are and the work that he has done by the cross. Don't come under the heavy yoke. Don't come under the weight of the world. Allow the spirit of God, the spirit of wisdom and revelation to pick you up and raise you higher. Chapter 4, it starts like this. At once I was in the spirit. He was in that place, in that reality of the throne room by the spirit of God. It's the spirit that brings us into the greater reality. All right. You know when, um, I think I've shared this before, but when, when Peter was at the gate of beautiful, called beautiful, and he, he prays for the man, the, the, the crippled man, and he says, money, I don't have it for you. Gold and silver, I've got nothing. But I do have something. I've got something. I am aware of a greater reality, an open heaven that is over my life right now. And from that place, I release the very life of God that's pulsating in that throne room, the lightnings, the thunders, the power, the dominion, the authority of that realm. In that, I have that over my head right now. This is what's going on in Peter's Peter's mind, this is how Jesus trained his disciples. I release it unto you. Be healed. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The man was instantly healed. When we pray for the sick, we become, I encourage you, take the time to become aware of your heavenly reality, where you're situated. Just take the time. Just actually become aware of it's not, it's not something you're drumming up. It's something you're becoming aware of. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your presence. You're always here. You just become aware. You begin to pray in tongues. Begin to stir yourself up. You're reminding yourself of that greater reality. And then when you feel it, when you feel that there's that, bang, release it. Prayer of faith, healed. See, Peter gave away, he didn't give away the name of Jesus. And I've said said this a lot before. You don't just say Jesus' name and things happen. It doesn't work like that. It's not a magic word, right? But you have the nature of Jesus in you. You are seated with him. You are big on the inside. You are, you are anointed from upon and on in. And you give away his nature. His name means little unless his nature is inside. Unless you are coming from that place, his name means very little. Tradies use the name of Jesus all the time. And we don't see crippled people walking on sight, do we, Mike? Isn't this fascinating? In, in uh, I think this is fascinating. Verse 11, chapter 4, verse 11. We actually hear the song of the, of the elders. The song of the elders. This is us, right? This is a picture of us. 
Jesus, uh, we are seated in this place. So this is a picture of us right now. This should be our song on earth and it's our song in heaven. And this is the song, you are worthy our Lord and God to receive glory and honour and power for you created all things and by by your will they were created and have their being. Have their being. This is the song of the people. Have their being. And then in Acts 17, 28, very famous scripture, in him we live and move and have our being. I love that, that word being. When you break it down, it's, it's closely linked with that word when, when God announces himself as I am, when he says, I am that I am. This is my name, I am. That word, have our being, is, a, is like a, an affiliate kind of word where, where you actually get to say in him, I live, I move, and I am. Do you know that Jesus doesn't want you just to be a good person. He wants to make you like him. It's not just about behavioral change. It's not just about uh, purity. All of that kind of stuff is wonderful, but it's about being like God. Like him in his likeness. We are being changed from glory to glory into his image, into his very likeness. So he gives us the honour of saying in him we live and move and have our being that we just are. And one of the most vital things for any believer to grab hold of is if you want to discover who you are and why you are alive, you have to discover who God is. You cannot find yourself outside of knowing him. Life has no meaning and makes no sense outside of that heavenly reality. Our pursuit for meaning must mean a a pursuit for him Intimacy with Jesus is not an option. It's like not an option. I think maybe there's a prevailing thought structure that, you know, yeah, by faith we're saved. But, but just faith doesn't give you intimacy. The sinner's prayer doesn't give you Intimacy. The sinner's prayer doesn't even give you friendship with God. I think it's false to say, and I I probably would never say to someone, I'm a friend of God. He wants to be my friend. Even John in Revelation, when he announces himself, he calls himself a servant of Jesus Christ. And he probably was the closest friend to Jesus that has ever, ever, ever lived. You don't become a friend just because you say the sinner's prayer. You become a friend because you learn to walk with him heart to heart, face to face. You know his voice. And often people will say to me, oh yeah, but I'm a believer, I know his voice. No, you know his voice when you learn his voice. It's not a a default thing. You're not positionally just a friend of God. He wants to be your friend. He died to be your friend. His very blood was shed for the purpose of making you his friend. But we will forever be knowing him. What does, God, what does God really want? Does he want a heaven full of people like a crowd, happy that they're there? Or does he want friends? 
Does he want people who just admire him? You know, thank you, Lord, for saving me. He wants friends. He wants friends. And I, I, think it's, I think it's wonderful that, you know, Jesus says, no longer do I call you servants, I, I call you friends. But you've got to remember, these guys were walking with him for three years, intimately, intimately. They became friends through journey. They became friends through relationship, through learning his voice, learning his rhythms, learning his ways, knowing his heart, learning his prayer language. They began to know him and then they came to a point that these are my friends. Friendship isn't an immediate work of the cross. Friendship is the result of relationship, communication, time spent together. That's what it takes to make a friend. One of the things, one of the traps about the religious spirit is it will say, I've got everything. That religious spirit will say, I'm a friend of God. It'll say all the right words, but there'll be no substance to it. There'll be actually no recognizing of the voice. There'll be no obedience. There'll be no hearing in the hearing, seeing in the seeing. It'll say all the right things, but really what it produces is lukewarmness and indifference, mediocrity, apathy. It kind of binds, it binds us. Jesus was talking to his, his disciple Philip, John 14 verse 9. This is what he says. After walking with him, even for so long, this is what he says to Philip. Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time. Such a long time. As Christians, we can memorize scriptures and apply them to our lives. We can receive his blessing and move in authority. But do we know him? Are we aware of him? Being a friend of God means identifying with him in thought and heart and spirit. We are servants becoming friends, forever becoming friends. Amen? Amen. I know that's a bit tough, isn't it? I believe that we're in a season. It's like we're in a season. It's like there's these moments of invitation. Moments of invitation where we're finding that... Uh, you know, even in our meetings, there's kind of like these things that the Lord is unlocking and there's these moments to respond. And in Revelation chap, uh, chapter, chapter 1, verse 11, verse 12, we see, we see an invitation again for John to come up higher. And this is what it says. He says, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw. And in verse 17, I mean, we all know what he saw, right? The, the, the one whose face is shining like the sun. His eyes are blazing like fire. His legs are like bronze. His voice is like waters. Out of his mouth came a two-edged sword. Verse 17, when I saw him, I fell as, as, I fell as though dead. There was an invitation. There was a moment of invitation to come up higher, to see Jesus as he really was. And in that moment of invitation, there was an, also an opportunity for him not to respond because he actually had to turn around and see it. And I believe that we're in this kind of season of moments of invitation where the Lord is saying, come up higher, come up higher, go lower, go lower, yield, yield, surrender, repent, get right, prepare the way. And there are people who are accepting it and there are people who are not. And these moments of these moments of invitation, I'm telling you, they will be preceded by a great visitation of the presence and the glory of the Lord. Moments of invitation will be preceded by, by a habitation and a visitation of revival, an outpouring of the Spirit of God. But those who, who, 
who don't find Jesus in those moments where he's inviting them into it are going to miss the season of revival. Because you know what? Believers from, from, the, from the day of Pentecost onwards, believers have missed outpourings of the Holy Spirit. They've actually missed it or they've condemned it. They've actually fought against it. They've said that can't be God. I was chatting with someone uh, on Friday night. We were talking about speaking in tongues. And don't you find it, I find it fascinating that there was no grid for speaking in tongues at all when, when Pentecost happened. The only grid that they had for what Pentecost was going to look like was Joel 2. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and it will look like prophecy and dreams. And visions. Nowhere in there was there this sharabodobo shakarabaha. And so when it happened, it was completely out of the box. We have to be so careful of condemning things, of accusing things and saying that they are not God. We have to be, we have to tread so so carefully. Imagine if they did that back then. Those tongues, what are they? There was no grid. There was nothing in Scripture in the Old Testament that actually told them about tongues. It's crazy. That, that's crazy, right? I've said it before and I got a bit of flack for it, but I'm okay with it. God is bigger than his book. He's bigger than the book. He's not bigger than his word. His word is steadfast. It will endure forever. But he's bigger than the book. What does that mean? It means we have to hold stuff really lightly. Really lightly. I want everything that he has for me. And if I... How do I say this? I... We want what's coming. We want what's coming. But history tells us Jesus often passes by people. Don't be a people who miss the invitation when it comes. When the invitations are there, when the Spirit of the Lord is moving, and you might not even feel it. You know what? I don't even feel it most of the time. It's not about feelings. Jump in. Every, every revival is preceded by yieldedness and repentance. Every one of them. And if they're not preceded by it, they're actually marked by it themselves. A revival is repentance. The need is so great for the people just to reorientate, 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 and recalibrate. Because what happens between revivals is you have a people that are very much set by the patterns of the world. And I believe that the Lord is saying in this season, he's saying, come up higher, I want to show you things. I want to show you who you are. I want to show you who I am. I want to show you what reality is. There are encounters that you can have with Jesus, the ascended Jesus, that make you as though dead. Dead. And isn't that what we need? (laughs) Just to die. Uh, I was reading a little while back um, on a guy called Frank Bartleman he was talking about the Azusa Street Revival and one of the things he remarked on is this. He was that the measure of Calvary that is worked out in a believer's life is the measure of the Pentecost that they will receive. The measure of the work of the cross that happens in a believer's life is unto the measure of the outpouring of the Spirit, the baptism of Jesus that they will receive. 
And it's, it, this is a common theme in every revival. Study it. I've been studying it for the past two years, reading about it all. And so we're asking for, for things to die in our lives. What are you asking the Lord to kill off in your life? That should be a number one question in your life. Listen, let's have a listen what happens here in, in verse 17. Revelations 1 verse 17. When I saw him, when I saw this ascended man in all of his glory, fully revealed, fully displayed in front of me, who was face was shining like the strength of 10,000 suns. When I saw this man, I fell at his feet as though dead. And there will be times when we say yes to the invitation to come up higher, to see him as he is, where we will have to die. There will have to be a dying. And when we die, it's actually only his hand that can raise us up again. Because it says in the next, in the next part, then he placed his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. Sometimes when you come that close, Because this is what we're praying for, right? We're saying, we want to behold you. We want to see you as you are. Show me your glory. Do we know what we're asking for? (laughs) Maybe it's good we don't know what we're asking for. But we want him. We want him. We want him like this. We want him like Revelations chapter 1, 4 and 5. We want that. We want that reality. That is the level. And to go there, there has to be a death. When I saw him, I fell as though dead. And only the right hand of God himself could bring me up out of that. We're not talking about courtesy falls in the spirit. We're talking about being slain by what we're seeing. Show me your glory. Lord, show us your glory. (laughs) Say it with me, come on. Lord, show us your glory. We want to see you rightly, Jesus. We want to see you as you are, whatever it costs us, whatever it costs our comfort, whatever it costs our convenience. Father, we're asking, Holy Spirit, we're asking that you would open our eyes, spirit of wisdom and revelation. Show us Jesus. Bring us into the knowledge of God. Show us what it is to live and move and have our being in you. In you, God. And Father, as a people, Lord, again, we repent, Lord. Lord, we repent, Father, of of lukewarm love, Father. Lord, where love has grown cold, Father, we repent, Lord. And Lord, we're asking you to make us hot again. Make us hot again. Father, we, I just thank you for that word that was released this morning, Lord, about the volcano. Lord, it's just so good. So good. Do it in us, Lord. Let us not miss that moment of visitation. Let us not mo- miss those moments of invitation, Lord. When you're moving, let us respond, Lord. Let us know your voice. I'm telling you, people, there is an incredible move and outpouring of the Spirit of God coming upon the earth. It has to come. <laughs> it has to come. It has to come. The great day of the Lord. The great and terrible day of the Lord. Do you know that there are aspects of the glory that are, are both beautiful and terrible? When he draws near, there's incredible beauty, incredible wonder, there's incredible terror and incredible fear. And strong men die the hardest. Strong men die the hardest. In fact, 
every move of God is usually led by laity. It's just by those, those humble ones that are just getting together in their homes and they're beginning to pray and they're beginning to seek God. They're doing it outside of the walls of the church. It's not usually led by, by notable figures. It's led by black men who just escape the noose and they go to a place in, in LA and they start up a meeting in a house. Started by the despised, by the lowly, by the rejected. There's a real challenge in this for us today. We're saying, Lord, you've got to do a work in us. Turn this place, Holy Spirit, into a house of prayer. Turn us as a people into a people of prayer. Turn our homes into homes of prayer. Homes of encounter. Homes of glory. People of presence. People of the secret place. People who know your voice. Would you stand with me? Thank you for listening to this message. We have many more messages and teachings on YouTube and on our website. For all our current events and services, please join our mailing list. Much love and God bless.